Now to our guest speaker. Really, really excited to have him here. Sid from GitLab, come on up. So Sid is the founder and CEO of GitLab. Um, if you don't know GitLab, I think most of you do, but uh, if you don't know it, it's a developer platform. So it's for um, you know, uh, source code management, continuous integration and delivery, issue tracking, things like that. And uh, GitLab is a really interesting company because they're a fully distributed team. And Sid's going to tell us all about that, how that works. Yeah. Welcome, thanks. Sid. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, we value our partnership with Mesosphere, and we're uh, working on some technical integrations. But that's not what I'm here about. I'm here to tell how we do remote only. I want to preface that by saying that we never expected to be a remote only organization. Uh, one of our values is boring solutions, and there are not a lot of remote only organizations, so we never expected to be one. Um, we thought it might have worked for developers. My co-founder is Dimitri from the Ukraine, and we started off remote. But when we got to San Francisco, we expected to grow a company there. We rented an office. Um, but at some point, people stopped coming into the office. And I, I think that was because they were not missing out on anything. Um, we think remote only changes you in some good ways. You tend to write more things down, um, be more structured, and that uh, helps you grow. Um, we did have to get really conscious about how we organize social connections. Because if you're in an office, they tend to happen naturally. Um, with remote, it doesn't happen, so you have to structure it. And we did it in a few ways, and I'm, I'm going to tell you more about the different ways in which we, we did that. But we were really conscious in going about that, and we're still in trying to improve every single day. Um, I think remote has a pretty bad name. Um, working from home kind of means you're slacking off for the day. Um, and I think that's because in many companies, it's not done properly. Um, you don't feel part of the team. There are no processes to help you set it up. There's um, you're judging people sometimes by the number of hours that they are online instead of their output. And it doesn't make for a very pleasant experience. We have many people that join our company that are kind of refugees being remote at another company, not liking the culture, not feeling part of the team, and then they, they come and work at us. And I think, and this is kind of, this was a slide deck originally for investors, if you can tell, you have to always say what change that makes it possible now. So this is that slide, um, fast internet, and all the different tooling you need to do remote properly. That is what changed, that is what makes it possible now. And it's great for team members. There's flexibility for other important people in your life, there's less commuting, there's less interruptions, like you can manage the interruptions, you can t turn them on and off. Uh, you, can, you have more ability to travel, and you're free to move cities without losing your job. We had over 20 people move countries within GitLab, and uh, they were able to keep their job. So you can follow your partner around the world, stuff like that. Um, we also think it helps the world, like less commuting means uh, less energy spent, and we're spreading the, the kind of the wealth that we're creating, which is now very concentrated in cities like this in SF. We're kind of spreading that a bit more around the world. This is a very long list because we also think it's really good for the company. Um, we can hire great people no matter where they live. That's been the biggest game changer for us. We're not limited to our office locations. It makes for more loyal employees. Our so-called voluntary turnover last year was 3.5%, even when we more than uh, doubled headcount. So that's a very low turnover for a startup. And I think it's because people like working with us. And we hear from a lot of people, I'm now spoiled. I'll never work for another company again that makes me come to the office. And 
one of the not so obvious kind of second second order effects it selects for self-starting people uh, we we tend to not have a lot of project management so either you manage yourself or you're not a good fit for the company and that means that the people that are self-managing are not confronted with team members that are not and number eight like it encourages a focus on results we're not we're not we're not measuring the time in the office we're not measuring your time online so there's really no way for us to tell whether you're effective apart from looking at your output and that's what we're set up to do uh, we did many different initiatives to make remote only work um, we have a and I'll, I'll go through each uh, each and every one of them so first off our team call it's uh, mostly about 80 people it's voluntarily but you're not allowed to plan over it so um, most people opt to join you can see in the lower left Stan who showing off his uh, shout like we encourage people talking about what they did um, some companies tend to have like almost a programmer culture where people do push-ups to show off to one another uh, we we like to think of us as having the opposite culture and there was a guy in south africa his name is the he brought his mom on the show his mom was pushing 60. he said she believes age is just a number and so she trained for a long time to be able to do 60 push-ups so we like we have a mom grammar culture I'm not quite sure but his mom was showing off the push-ups right in the team call so I'm, I'm very proud of having a company where people show off their family members uh, instead of trying to one-up each other um, it's four times a week it's about 10 minutes spent on new hires and kind of not discussion points as much as as, um, as not quick announcements it used to be discussion points and then the meetings tend to last for three hours uh, so that doesn't make sense and then it's mostly spent people talking about their day what they did in the weekend mostly uh, so you're up every like two weeks and you talk about what you what interesting things you did for the weekend uh, there's a few rules you cannot say that you're it was not interesting what you did um, so just tell us if you watch television don't tell us you watch television tell us what television you watched so we tend to all got on the same schedule where everyone was working, watching Narcos at the same time, kind of people took hints. Um, this is a screenshot of the agenda and, and these announcements, it's basically reading up what's there. Everything has a link. If you want more information, just go there. Then we do functional group updates. Um, these are uh, about, 20 or something functional groups that present this has been the progress in finance or this has been the progress with this technical team um, there's a presentation of about 10 to 15 minutes and the rest of the time is spent uh, answering questions that come up in chat and it's a really nice way to steep it, uh, to stay informed and we do at the end of the week on Friday we do a, a public blog post so you can you can go to our website look at our blog see the functional group updates and really know a lot more than you ever care to know about what's going on inside the different parts of GitLab. One thing I like very much is uh, real-time notes. So in GitLab, if you plan a meeting, you're either going to give a presentation and take questions on them, or you have an agenda. So it's not acceptable to not have a presentation or an agenda linked. And the agenda needs to be a Google Doc that's open at least for editing by everyone in the company. So beforehand, you can see what's up. Then people uh, kind of indent their questions in the agenda, preface with their name. So you you kind of you say what you wanted to say. Then you then then you give the word to the person asking the question, and then we take real time notes about the conclusions. So we never have a meeting that starts with let's acknowledge the notes from last meeting or something like that. No, the notes were there being taken as you talked. So at, at the end of the meeting, everyone is literally on the same page, know what has to be done. And I think it's, it's, it's so much more efficient, so much faster, so much more pleasant than having a formal note keeper that has to kind of write up the whole meeting and then seeing notes over email a week later. Um, 
being remote means it's even more important to know who's part of the company. You don't see any people in the office. So we have a, a team page. You can go there. It's a public one. And it has everyone. It even has a, a map of where everyone is. But it also has for everyone who they report to, what their expertises are. And we're very liberal with handing out these things. So many questions in the company are always like, who's the person that knows more about chef cookbooks? Well, you can, tr you can find on our page. If you click them, you can see their, a bit of their personal story. Um, but it's really important to add these notes like, this, one is a, this person is a trained release manager, or this person is a GitLab Summit expert. Then we also have our team structure. So it's dynamically generated. So our org chart is never out of date. And everyone can view it, and everyone can see where people stand. So if they want to go, they're not happy with someone, they, they, they can find out who their boss is and go to them. Messaging, we're big users of Slack. Um, we're very liberal in, in talking about other subjects on Slack. We also talk about maybe the, uh, the things that you wouldn't normally talk about in a formal way. So when we were fundraising, people had questions about the fundraising. And in a normal office, you'd walk in after pitching, and people would ask, hey, Sid, how did it, how did it go today? And we didn't have that, so people were asking me questions. So I said, OK, we'll, we'll do it. We'll have a fundraising channel. But at the top, it says, don't get distracted by the roller coaster uh, that is fundraising, because that was a, that's why I didn't want to do it. But we did it. It worked out really well. And they got a play by play. Like, we went to this VC, and they said no. And I was most proud when we announced our, our fundraise. The first question was from a developer. And they asked, OK, what's the liquidation preference on this deal? A person who didn't even know what a VC was maybe at the beginning of the fundraising process. So everyone educated themselves. Uh, our handbook is the most, I think, visible artifact of our remote culture. It's over 500 pages long, and it details all the processes in our company. It's public, so you can look at it. Um, we try to detail anything and everything. And I think the biggest help to us has been with recruiting new team members and onboarding them. We have people that, by the time they're interviewing with me, they say, I've read your entire handbook. I want to work at this company. So it allows people to self-select and probably also to self-opt out. Like, I, won't, I wouldn't be talking to the people that don't want to work at us. But we need only a few percent of people to work at us, and I, I think um, we're certainly getting there, where, where, where people are really enthusiastic about working at GitLab. And they already onboard it. They already know everything that's going on in the company and how we work by the time that they, they're for, uh, they start. So you're able to onboard really effectively. Um, obviously, being GitLab, we, have, we make issue trackers, and we tend to use them for everything, including finance and marketing. Um, we do GitLab University, a company training program. Uh, the difference with us is it's all public. And then onboarding, we take a lot of time. We invest a lot of time in making sure that uh, people can see exactly how their onboarding is going. So everyone gets an issue. It has, I think, over 60 check marks in it. And you can see who's supposed to do something for you, whether you have to do it yourself or who else has to do it. And you can follow the progress as you go along. And I think it's really empowering to be able to track the progress of your onboarding. It's not like, oh, yeah, someone forgot to add you to that system. I'm sorry that you looked around for two days. No, you can see who should be adding you to what system. <clears throat> and one thing at the bottom, you can see uh, the virtual coffee breaks. So you can see everyone that starts at GitLab has to take a couple of virtual coffee breaks. And I'll explain later what that is. Having a handbook makes it really easy for people to give suggestions. If you've written down everything that you do, it's really easy to make a suggestion to change it. And that's what I found at previous companies that was kind of ambiguous, how you change a process. With us, it isn't. You send a suggestion to change the text in the handbook, and when it gets accepted, that's it. The process just changed. 
you might communicate uh, the diff or the merge request on the on the team call to tell everyone. And we also do something offline. Um, we do team summits. Uh, they're every nine months. It's a week long, and we really focus not on like it's not like a, a management offsite where we all um, try to make a plan for the next quarter. Because guess what? We do it every nine months, so it wouldn't be nice if we if we needed that. Um, we focus on bringing people together and creating these social connections. So we do scavenger hunts. Um, I'm looking forward to doing uh, user-generated content sessions where people um, suggest and vote up subjects they want to talk about. And it's very important that it's like cross-functional so that you're not spending it with your own team, but meeting everyone within the company. There's a big drop in productivity during those that week and actually the week before it and the week after it but we think it's totally worth it. This was our first one in Austin, and this was our last one in January in Cancun, Mexico. Um, I still owe you the virtual coffee break. So what those are um, is like that hallway conversation you tend to have in a company here where you can just chat with someone. We empower people to do that. We call it virtual coffee breaks. And you just plan it in someone's calendar. You send them a calendar invite, call it virtual coffee break, and you get to chat with someone. And we're trying to like lower the stigma of having like an agendaless meeting, uh, just a casual meeting, and it's perfectly fine if you don't discuss anything business related during that meeting. And anyone can do it with anybody. So some people sent me virtual coffee breaks, and I'm always really thankful if they do. In conclusion, um, so far, it's working really well for us. I think um, the nice thing is if you grow really fast, having everything about your company documented allows people to ramp up a lot faster. Also uh, allows you to like relate your culture and how you work a lot better because you get to do it uh, formally. Um, so that's been great. I think we're in a very advantaged position because we're completely remote. It's much harder if you're a hybrid, where some people are in the same location, but some are not. Um, we're, we're not wedded to this idea of remote only. If it doesn't work, we'll change it. Um, we'll do whatever it takes. Uh, it's not part of our values, uh, but so far, so good. And I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Sid, I'm actually going to read one that's uh, um, uh, remote. So how does GitLab deal with time zone differences, challenges, solutions? Yeah, thanks. Glad that the first question is remote. Um, it's the end of distances, but not the end of time zones. Time zones are absolutely horrible. Um, I think we should get rid of them, but I have no idea how. Um, one of the big things is that our team members in Asia Pacific, for them, the timing to join our regular team call that's kind of optimized for America, Europe, is not ideal. Uh, it's so they can't, so they have their own team call um, once a week, which is not as good. Um, look, I'd rather have everyone in the same call. So we do record all of our meetings, we do record all of our functional group updates, and all the Everything is a Zoom meeting, it's recorded, it's dumped into a Google Drive, you can find it. We'll publish the functional group updates on our blog. So we try to like time shift as much as we can, but we haven't solved this. Great, a uh, couple more remote ones. What mechanism is in place to help remotes know that they are on track? Yeah, no, um, what we, uh, what's really important in a, if you work for a company is a sense of progress. And the sense of progress you get to um, having the feeling yourself and getting that acknowledged by your manager. Um, the most important thing we do is we give everyone exactly one boss. And that boss knows what you're working on, can guide you, is, is an expert in the functional matter you're working on. So we don't have a matrix organization. And having that one boss that has between five and 10 reports can give you a lot of like, detailed feedback can help you be uh, more effective 
is, I think, uh, one of the best benefits. We also have an OKR process, and uh, our OKRs are public. So if you want to look, know more about our, um, uh, our No Matrix organization, uh, Google GitLab Leadership. If, if you want to know more about our OKRs, Google GitLab Strategy and scroll to the bottom of the page. Um, and then a couple of people had some questions, and I think you answered this about video calls and what tools you're using. Is it um, Zoom and Google Hangouts? Yeah, so it's it's multiple things. Um, Zoom is great because it allows us to be in the same call with the whole company, uh, and it's really effective. So we're kind of switching everything to Zoom. Then for um, one or for smaller calls, some people still do, do Hangouts. And for impromptu calls, people tend to use Slack video calling. Anyone in the US that has questions, or I'm sorry, in San Francisco that has questions? Share in the back. You said that um, you had a lot of different employees move to different countries. Um, how do you deal with immigration, and does the company support that? Yeah, um, so a few things. Uh, we tend to set up uh, an entity in every country where we have like a substantial presence, like here in the UK, in the Netherlands. Then uh, employees uh, around the world tend to be freelancers. And then for us, for example, it's, it's relatively easy to organize a work permit in the Netherlands, so you can apply for uh, immigrating there. Um, for the rest, people don't have to travel it's only our summits that are a problem but we're now getting pretty good at making sure people can get a, a business visa and just have lawyers that do these kinds of stacks of paper uh, it's been some very sad stories like dimitri tried to get into greece and like they wouldn't even acknowledge his appointment and we had at our last summit we had one person from africa that couldn't join because they rejected his visa but we're getting really good at it now and we last summit we got everyone in so um, you mentioned earlier um, that people self-select kind of when, when they're looking at GitLab. And um, I was kind of curious, how do, you, how do you interview and deal with the situation where someone doesn't know if they're a good, or they don't, you know, maybe they, they've never worked remote before? Um, because I find that we have that situation a lot where we're kind of interviewing someone and we're They've never worked remote before, and we, we don't actually know if it's going to be a good fit, and they don't know. So how do you evaluate that in that situation? Yeah, people think that we maybe have a really good test for that, but we don't. Uh, we do ask them whether they're comfortable with it, with the whole concept. Um, it's, it's more of a getting a heads up on any concerns. If people are good at their job, they tend to be good um, working remote too. Um, people that are effective tend to write things down. They tend to be structured. They tend to be good writers. Um, we never had someone leave the company because they worked remote like, or because they weren't able to work remote. Um, we do offer to buy people a workspace. So if they don't want to work from home, but they want some like distance, that's fine. Uh, it tends to be that after three months, they get rid of the workspace and they start working from home. But it, it, it's a good transition period. If there are any team members nearby, we suggest that they meet up with a team member every, every week just for their feeling. Um, they do report that the first month is rough. Um, we've introduced the virtual coffee breaks that we make you take 10 of to help with that. We've introduced a buddy that, you can, that is supposed to help you with all your dumb questions. Uh, that helps. Um, it's still because we've uh, we documented so much people feel overwhelmed by the amount of materials so we now try to structure it almost per day what you should read um but we had i think zero people leave because they said i can't make this remote thing work zero uh, which is kind of surprising uh, as an engineer, one of the situations in which I find face-to-face -face meetings most useful uh, is for design sessions when there's a lot of whiteboarding going on. Are, are there any tools or techniques that you guys use to help in those situations? Yeah, we're big believers in face-to-face -face meetings, just not in person. So we always, we always try to simulate getting on a video call together because it's so much higher bandwidth. Um, for most meetings, a Google Docs or something suffices. 
Um, for design, it's harder. Uh, we're big users of Sketch. Uh, I think we added Sketch rendering. will be in GitLab 9.1 uh, so that you can, can preview to those designs in an issue. Um, I, I'm not aware of <coughs> any other real-time tools that we use for that. How do you handle diversity in this culture? Um, so a few things. Um, because um, we can recruit from anywhere, we are much more diverse uh, culturally, geographically. Uh, one of the things has been that uh, open source projects tend to be almost 99% male, and a lot of our contributors came from the open source community, so that's been a struggle for us. We do believe that working remote and having a flexible schedule where you're in control makes it easier to combine uh, it with the rest of your life. Does that answer your question? <laughs> well, sort of. I mean, for us, we try and like actively go find uh, from academies or wherever else to recruit more women, but being remote, it's I can't imagine how you would do it. So I was curious on that end, but yeah, um, we do we do have a several um, uh, uh, recruiting channels that are focused on minorities uh, or, or underrepresented minorities and women. So that's where we try to focus our like recruiting efforts. I have another question. Does it end up? Uh, does this kind of culture end up attracting a certain personality type? Because I can't work remote, so it's just. Some people can, some people can't, so. Um, I think it, it, what I said earlier, it tends to weed out people that are not a manager of one. So if, if you're not able to, to motivate yourself to, to get results every day, it's just really yeah. easy to slack off and do other things. Like um, no one's watching your screen. If you don't produce for a day, no one will find out. Um, so, so it, it requires more discipline than some other companies. I have another question. This one is from uh, our office in Hamburg, Germany. Talk was very focused on the positive things. What are some of the things that don't work well remote? What are the challenges that you've had to ever overcome and the solutions? Um, I think if you, if you don't write things down as leadership, um, you're going to have a problem. So at a certain point, we said, okay, the, the whole the whole executive team has to get on board with this and start writing things down, and we make that change. Um, another thing that's been problematic has been uh, fundraising. So our fundraising went great. We 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 did we started in the beginning of June, and by the end of June, we had three term sheets. But we did have some really good investors drop out and say, look, by being a completely remote organization. It's really hard to get you guys acquired at a good price. So we, we're not comfortable betting only on the IPO. We, we want to see an acquisition story here too. That's what we see in all our companies. And for, for you guys, it's going to be half the price because you, they can't acquire the, the physical people and integrate them into their office. So for that reason, we're out. This one's a little lengthy. <laughs> As a remote employee, I feel pretty anxious about making sure my output is visible. Sometimes I spend time on work that does not yield the results I hope, or results that are not visible as other tasks, like tracking down flaky test causes, brainstorming work, etc. I think people measure time and hours because output is difficult. Do you sense this in your own organization? Are there any practices to help you correct for a bias to only notice certain types of effort? Yeah, that's really good. And uh, not, not all work is as visible. Um, I think like in any organization, I'd recommend that people do call attention to, to what they've achieved. And it doesn't have to be a very self-promotional way, but just make sure that, um, that people know what you spend time on um, or spend time on. Don't defend the time spent, but if you solved a really hard bug, just you you can you can tell like you can create you can you can stay in the issue look i'm really happy i've been able to solve this um the one way the best way we solve this is by giving you a manager that really understands what you're doing so everyone has a functional leader so if you're in front end you have someone that knows front end really well so they tend to be a lot better at estimating like how much work 
you've produced, what your output is, what your results have been. So I think that's the important part. And if you're in a, if your boss is like a cross-functional boss, they might not be able to to appreciate how much work, how much results you've you've achieved. So so that's the number one thing. Giving you that boss that is doesn't have a lot of reports that knows exactly the work you're doing and is actively contributing uh, him or herself as well. Anyone else? All right, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.